singing, so I'm going to have ask everybody to help me with this one. Uh, a little background about this song. Well, first of all, I can never get up and sing without talking. So you'll probably never give me a microphone again. But anyway, a little bit about the background of this song. Uh, one day I was messing around with guitar, and this kind of fell out, and I thought, that's kind of cool. So I thought there should be words with it. So I opened up the Bible and it kind of fell open to Psalm 117. I was reading the NIV version at the time, which, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Psalm 117, I think is the shortest chapter in the Bible. Anyway, it's really short. So it says, praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. I see Steve is reading back there. Am I right? For great is his love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord, right? So anyway, that's the NIV version. So that's where this song came from. And it's pretty simple, so I'm going to ask you to... I'll sing it through at once. And you guys can sing on the second time. Maybe. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol With that, let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. And this morning we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, freedom. And so... <laughs> and in Romans chapter 6, we'll not read the whole chapter, but 
We'll pick it up in verse 14. And Paul is explaining our position in Christ and what it means. And one of the things it means is this, is that sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because we've been set free uh, from it. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And that's in direct reference to the gospel. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin... You were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the position that we have in Christ. And we thank you that you give us a new purpose and you are willing and want to be uh, our new leader, our master in our life. We pray that we'd be willing to submit to uh, your leadership, knowing that it is the best for us, knowing that it will, it's designed to bring honor and glory to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we, we thank you uh, for, this, uh, for this reminder. Uh, we also want to uh, pray for each other, and uh, not just for <laughs> physical ailments, but also uh, for each other in general, that uh, we would be willing to show our love uh, through prayer. And as we pray for each other, that uh, we could be strengthened uh, spiritually in Christ, and that our uh, standing and freedom could just be made more sure uh, in our thinking. Uh, we want to uh, pray for our country this morning. We thank you for it. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. Uh, we thank you for the fact that uh, we as a nation have probably been blessed more than any other nation, uh, at least in modern history. Uh, and we want to thank you for that. And we uh, don't want to forget that these blessings are a gift of your grace. They're the result of acknowledging uh, who you are. And so we pray that our nation would uh, not forget the God of the Bible, would not forget the principles that uh, you have laid out for us, that we would not forget that you created us to serve you. And each one of us is made exactly how you want us to be. And that each one of us has been given a gift to serve God. And so we, we pray that that would uh, uh, just become a reality in more and more of people's minds. And so we, we thank you for uh, this service this morning. And we just pray that as uh, we spend a few moments uh, together looking in your word that uh, we could be impressed with the uh, things that God has done for us and that we would take his warnings uh, seriously and that we would understand that there is a right way and there is a wrong way and we pray that our heart's desire would be 
that uh, we want to follow that which is right. And so we uh, pray to that end. We thank you. Uh, again, for this day, we want to commit this service to you. Uh, we uh, uh, thank you for life that you've given us uh, here on earth. We thank you for the uh, time on earth that you've given uh, Al Gregerson. We, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, let's, uh, we are in the book of 2 Peter, and uh, uh, I was hoping to get through uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, but we're not going to do it and, uh, uh, this morning, but we will uh, kind of wrap, uh, wrap things up in a big way uh, this morning in chapter 2. Uh, last, uh, 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 we won't get to the uh, backsliders quite yet. We'll have to save some of that for uh, next week. But as we think of, of uh, Peter and Jude, uh, those books, uh, particularly Second Peter, is really a strong warning against false teachers and being led astray. And as we think of uh, uh, the Bible telling us not to be critical, and we shouldn't be critical of each other, and yet at the same time, what we find is that Peter and Jude are very critical of the uh, false teachers that he's warning us against. And so uh, the false teachers, <laughs> to uh, sum it up in chapter 2, verse 1, they deny the Lord that bought them. Uh, these false teachers are the wolves that Paul warned about in the church at Ephesus. Wolves that, in fact, he warned of wolves that would come from the outside and wolves that would come from the inside. These are wolves from the outside. And uh, uh, they're very smooth operators. And, uh, and their lifestyle, they actually count it a pleasure uh, to, be, to be raunchy. Is that, is that a good word? And, uh, and misbehave and to lead people astray. Uh, they just get a bang out of it. And if they can deceive people, it's kind of like a feather in their hat. And it's important for us to keep that in mind, that if we're not anchored to the truth, Satan, if he can lead us astray, and he uses his servants to do that, uh, he's laughing at you behind your back. And, uh, and we, we think we've maybe made an impression, uh, and uh, Satan, we can get on his good side. No, you can't. No, you can't. One of the characteristics of Satan, sin, and error is that there is no love for you. There is no positive direction for your future. Uh, nothing there. Now, in Jude, uh, we uh, looked at the way of uh, Cain, the heir of Balaam, and uh, we didn't say much about the uh, rebellion of Korah, but uh, I'll just mention this. Korah was a rebel. And uh, Korah um, uh, rebelled against the structure that God had set up. Uh, Korah lived uh, after Mount Sinai, after the events of Kadesh Barnea, when the spies uh, went into the land and, and God actually told the nation of Israel, listen, uh, I'm done with you. Uh, in fact, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, God said, I am so disgusted with this people. I want to kill them all, and I'll make a new nation out of you, Moses. What do you think? And Moses says, God, you can't do that uh, because these are your chosen people. And, uh, and what would the nations think uh, after you've saved them from Egypt and after, after you've provided for them, it would not be good. Uh, it would be a terrible testimony. And uh, don't make a new nation out of me. And God looked at Moses and said, you know what, Moses, I like that attitude. Because there's a lot of people that would say, you mean I could replace Abraham as the father of Israel? Ah, I'm going to go for it. And uh, uh, instead of Abraham being the father of faith, uh, I'll be the father of faith. Uh, I'll, I'll take you up on that, God. And Moses said, no. No. And Korah, uh, after that, uh, rebels against Moses and Aaron. And uh, he wants to be the high priest. He wants to uh, supplant them. And he leads a rebellion. 
And that rebellion happened with a, uh, uh, a curse that was put on Korah. In fact, the curse was a very short-lived curse. Uh, God told Moses, listen, um, here's what I want you to do. Uh, you take your censers, and we'll see which ones I accept. So you separate Korah and his family, and that's the story where the earth opened up and swallowed them up and closed in over them, and they died screaming while they fell in, uh, into the earth. Uh, a, a, a terrible death, I would think, uh, uh, at least for a few moments anyway. That would really uh, you know, give you a rush, I, I would think. And the, he had 250 uh, uh, priests lined up to uh, uh, lead this insurrection and overthrow Aaron. And they all ended up uh, getting killed. And God's order of what he had established, and God established an order in Israel. And it was the Levites. Uh, and Aaron was the high priest at that time. And the Levites, that particular tribe, was chosen by God to be the, the, uh, the tribe of priests. And that isn't going to change. And God's uh, uh, choices that he makes don't change. And, uh, and Korah tried to do that. Well, um, as we think of uh, false teachers, uh, just to kind of uh, sum up, um, they, uh, uh, we looked at uh, Cain, uh, he had uh, approached God in his own way. But just another uh, little point. He had no love for his brother. In fact, he asked God, am I my brother's keeper? And the point uh, that I'd like to make is this, is that whether it's Satan or false teachers, they use people. There's not a genuine love for people. Um, and it's important that, uh, that we understand that. Who has your best interest at stake? And it starts with God himself. And it starts with, uh, as, as we move through and think of obedience to God's word, it is to our eternal benefit to pay attention to what God uh, has for us in the instructions that he has. Uh, most of us, from time to time, really think that we know what's best, and we know uh, uh, well, a lot of things. In fact, sometimes uh, we know more than God. And, uh, uh, and come on, folks, we don't. Uh, Balaam. Balaam was not motivated to serve God out of thanksgiving uh, for all that he has done and the blessings that he had. Uh, Balaam was motivated by greed and glory. And he wanted position. And as we uh, just think of how that related to the false teachers, just very briefly, um, false teachers were motiva motivated by greed and their lust. And Peter uh, says that and, uh, and points that out. Um, and then we came to Korah. Korah rebelled against God's order. He led that rebellion against Moses. And as we stop and we think of how that relates, and Jude is the one who, who makes reference to Korah. Uh, Peter actually doesn't. But uh, false teachers have no regard for God's standards and established orders. And, uh, and as we stop and we think of the institutions that God has established, uh, uh, starting with the, uh, 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 the individual, uh, and then the family, uh, God established these institutions. He established an order. And what we find today is that there is no regard for those institutions and those orders that God has uh, established. It's interesting that God uh, also established nations. And he established borders. Uh, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? In fact, the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill reminds the Greeks, that it's God who establishes borders. And what do we see today? 
we see a, a disregard for nations. We see a, a disregard for borders. And, uh, uh, and as we think of this country, it, it should be dismaying to us that um, uh, we are not uh, concerned uh, about what God has established. Well, uh, I uh, picked eight characteristics and summation of this particular chapter, so we'll go through them rather quickly. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, we uh, read this, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise uh, dignitaries or government, uh, they are lawless. They walk after the flesh. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, result, uh, they have no regard for the authority of God's Word. Uh, number two, and the end of verse uh, 10, uh, their arrogance. And as we think of uh, arrogance, how is that shown? They rail on anyone. They don't care. Uh, even angels, um, they'll attack. And uh, uh, you think, wow. Uh, uh, and in Jude, the uh, reference is made that even Michael in fighting Satan over the body of Moses, and we don't really know what that battle was all about, but he didn't dare to bring a charge against Satan. He left that uh, to God. But the false teachers, they had no problem at all. Number three, in verse 12, they have ignorance. Uh, it reads like this, but these is natural brute beast made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own uh, corruption. The idea is, is that animals don't reason. Animals act out of instinct. In fact, uh, uh, if you raise livestock, what do you raise them for? You raise them to kill them and to eat them. And, uh, uh, and uh, you don't sit down and explain to a steer uh, his end. You don't do that. They're not capable of reason. And uh, Peter likens false teachers to that uh, to animals that are killed. Uh, they're unable to reason from the Scriptures. Uh, did I say from? Oh, spell checker. <clears throat> oh. The, um, um, it's F-R-O-M, I'm sorry. The, uh, they're incapable of reasoning. And this is why Peter is saying there comes a time when you just have to leave them alone. And, uh, and move on and not try to argue. Well, let's uh, go on. In verse 13, uh, they're characterized by bad behavior. And they shall receive re the reward of unrighteousness as they count it a pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes. And the idea here is they actually like chaos. And it, it, it's interesting. Uh, those people, even in our country on the national level, that promote chaos, that isn't God's way. God is a God of order. And God uh, wants things done decently and in order. And uh, he wants church services to be handled decently in order. Uh, we, we do our best, but uh, 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 that, that's his plan for us. As we stop and we think, uh, they pretend to be pious, and, uh, but their spots and blemishes. And uh, we took some time to uh, define what those spots and blemishes are really all about. And we uh, mentioned this, that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who was without spot and blemish. And Peter makes reference to that in uh, 1 Peter. And so um, this is not Jesus Christ that he is describing at all. Well, let's, let's move on. Uh, they're deceptive. In verse 13, uh, we read this. We're at the end of that. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings 
while they feast with you. And the idea of sporting uh, right there with their own deceivings is uh, uh, they get a kick out of leading people astray. And you know what so-and-so believed? Uh, you know, I, uh, we've, we, we've got another one, another uh, sucker, you might say. And uh, how do they do that? They take Scripture out of context and they appeal to the flesh. They appeal to feelings. And uh, keep in mind that the Bible is God's objective truth. And we as human beings uh, tend to get very subjective very quickly. How do I feel about things? How does this affect you? Um, and uh, there comes a time when we need to just stand up and say, you know what? My feelings don't matter. What does the Word of God have to say? And, uh, and objective truth is what we need. Uh, verse 14, they're immoral. Uh, we read on, and having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin. And the idea there is they are trapped in their own sin and guilty of enticing weak or new believers uh, literally to move uh, in the wrong uh, direction. And uh, don't, uh, don't kid yourself. We can get trapped by sin. And uh, uh, many of you have heard people uh, talk like this. Maybe you have yourself, oh, I just can't help myself anymore. I, I, I'm just, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm trapped. Has anybody ever heard that? I just can't help myself. And uh, uh, these false teachers are just that way. And as we look on, the, uh, uh, in this right here, he says, beguiling unstable souls, a heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. And so, as we think of uh, enticing new believers, those are the unstable souls right there. And typically, when uh, the church is very young at this, this age, the, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, was just formed. The apostles laid the foundation. And... There wasn't anybody in the church that was been saved for 40, 50 years, you know, some old saints. There weren't any. Uh, the church had just started. And uh, uh, new believers need to be taught the Word of God. And as they're taught the Word of God, they become more stable. And uh, there's a foundation that is, uh, that is built. And... Uh, uh, before that foundation is sent, uh, what do the false teachers do? They're attacking uh, these uh, young believers who have not been established in the Word of God. Uh, verses 15 and 16, we'll read it. Which have forsaken the right way. And I mentioned this, that if there's a right way, that means there's a wrong way. And, as we, uh, and that's implied in the passage. And if they've forsaken the right way, then that means they're headed down the wrong way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam. So is Balaam the right way or the wrong way? Well, it has to be the wrong way. Uh, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb uh, donkey speaking with men's voice forbade the madness uh, of the prophet. And so what was uh, Balaam? Well, just to sum it up, he was motivated by greed and covetousness. And that's what the, uh, the text clearly says is one of the motivating factors for the uh, false teachers. Well, let's, uh, let's read on. Uh, in number eight, uh, they're empty of content. Uh, verse 17, these are wells without water, Clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved uh, forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure. And uh, we noted this, that that word allure right there is a fishing term. Uh, it's to uh, uh, entice. Uh, that's the idea. And uh, we read on. Uh, 
These are wells without water. Now, the word these is in reference to the false teacher to whom the false teachers, uh, the mists or the gloom of darkness is reserved forever. Uh, listen, uh, just stop and think about this for a second. If there is a person who's rejected Jesus Christ and is on their way to hell, they're on their way, literally this is in reference to the lake of fire, why would you want to follow that person when you know their end? And uh, uh, Peter is saying that, that, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, and I've, uh, uh, they're like dry wells, and uh, let's, let's carry that on. Their destiny is the gloom of darkness. That's in reference to the lake of fire. But how do you entice people with no content? And uh, I, I, I couldn't help but be reminded of some of our politicians. Now, I don't want to offend anyone, but is any of you old enough to remember Hubert H. Humphrey? I think he grew up in uh, uh, Waverly, didn't he? That's his hometown. And uh, I don't know if it was a joke, but uh, in Washington, uh, there was this school of Hubert Humphrey. And what it taught was this, and uh, uh, is how a politician could answer a yes or no question in about 20 minutes without answering the question. And if you remember anything about Hubert Humphrey, uh, no matter what the question was, that guy could talk and talk and talk, and when he was done talking, you didn't have a clue what he said. You didn't have a clue. Well, we know one thing for sure. The question never got answered. And uh, uh, now if you're an old Democrat and you voted for HHH, uh, don't, don't be offended because he's not alone. Uh, his legacy lives on in Washington. And uh, how frustrating have you all been at times when politicians are asked simple yes and no question, uh, questions and they can't answer it. And they don't. But they give these long answers that don't answer. And, uh, and, but they do it with pizzazz. They do it with flair. They talk confidently. And people often are impressed with speakers who sound like they know what they're talking about. That's why it's important to know your Bible, to know the Scripture. Because it doesn't matter how something is said, what matters is what is said, and does it line up with Scriptures? Did you know that everything you hear should be verifiable in the Word of God? I don't care if it's me. I don't care who it is. You should be able to open your Bible and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I see that. It's right here. It's verified in God's Word. Um, our politicians today, the false teachers of uh, Peter's day, there was nothing that was verified in God's Word. And how did they do that? Well, with great oratory. And people that can speak well, oh, they've got it made. And, uh, uh, and, or they can gain a lot of influence or power. Uh, they also appeal to our base desires. Um, you know, we all want to be free, don't we? You know, it, it, it's interesting of our teenagers today. Teenagers today are uh, very good at, they want to be individuals. We don't follow the herd. Are you kidding? You can't even get dressed in the morning without calling your friends to see what color they're wearing. Is, do people still do that? I don't know. Um, they... Uh, uh, everybody dresses the same. Everybody talks the same. They pick up the same lingo. Uh, we are so herd bound, it's scary. And it happens among adults, even in church. It's surprising how many people, you know, they say, Well, if, if I come and visit your church, how do people dress? Well, I don't know. Well, I want to fit in. How many rules do you have? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, uh, and there's this unspoken uh, 
law, you might say, that uh, uh, we sense. And yet, uh, if we can appeal to your feelings and set you free from all that, uh, you're going to be in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Fat City, I guess, and uh, feel better about yourself. So it's all about ourselves. How do you feel? Um, uh, you want to be rich? You want to be healthy? You want to be healthy, wealthy, and wise? Well, uh, listen to me and uh, do what I say, and uh, I, I think you'll get a new Mercedes pretty soon. You've got to be kidding. All right, the, uh, uh, the promise of freedom. And as we stop and we think of freedom, um, the promise typically is around physical things. It's, it's freedom from poverty, from want. Uh, who wants to be a slave to poverty? So let's uh, start some new deals or something like that. And I, I kind of had to laugh. Uh, this was before my time, by the way. Uh, if you remember FDR, you're really old. He was before HHH. Um, uh, what did he say? A chicken in every pot. Did you know that at the same time FDR was saying a chicken in every pot, Adolf Hitler was saying a car in every driveway. And they established the Volkswagen, which is, in German, Volks is the people's car. Uh, and there you go. And, uh, I mean, why stop with chickens? Let's go for cars. And, uh, uh, and you know what? People went for it. People want to be free from sickness. Uh, did you know that the Apostle Paul, he didn't want to be sick. And in 2 Corinthians 12, he prayed that God would heal him. And you know what God told him? God said, no, I'm not going to heal you. And here's why. Because if you were healthy, wealthy, and wise, with all that I'm using you for, and Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, you would get the big head. I want you to limp around on low energy, so that you know if anything's accomplished, it's not you doing it, it's me doing it. And furthermore, because of how I've used you, there's other people that will put you on a pedestal. And I don't want people to put you on a pedestal, Paul. Jesus Christ is the one who belongs on the pedestal. So I'm just going to keep you limping around. And, and we think of Paul. Uh, history tells us that Paul was a short, pudgy, ugly guy with a unibrow and had a squeaky voice and apparently had a limp and he couldn't see very well. And uh, that's the kind of character that God used. Wow, you guys look pretty healthy today. Uh, just imagine if you'd let him how much God could use us, perhaps. But that's his business not ours. We just need to make ourselves available. And when it was all done, Paul said, you know what? When I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Why? Because the power of God can shine through me. And, uh, and so we think of freedom and what freedom is all about. And, uh, uh, and so uh, we've looked at this before. When a person places their trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Something big happens in them. And what happens? What happens is this. The Holy Spirit indwells us. The, our spirit is regenerated. Uh, that's sometimes referred to as the new birth. And we become a new creation in Christ. And as we stop and we think of uh, this new creation and being free and being set free, and like we read this morning in the book of Romans, and let's, uh, let's turn back to the book of Romans and, and we'll uh, uh, see what Paul is talking about. In Romans chapter 6, he talks about our position in Christ. He talks about how uh, we have a new master, and we read about that uh, this morning. But then in Romans chapter 7, uh, the Apostle Paul 
notes something else. And so I'm going to put a picture of the Apostle Paul right there. And if you're saved, that's a picture of you. And don't forget that when you get saved, your sin nature is still hanging around. People that believe that they don't have a sin nature have deceived themselves. And so the Apostle Paul has this to say. And he says this, and I'll, I'll pick it up. I won't go through the whole chapter here. Um, and, but I'll pick it up in verse 19. For the good that I would, I don't. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And what's he saying? He's saying, since he's got saved, through that new creation in Christ, there's a desire to do what's right. So I want to do what's right. And guess what? I don't. And I don't want to do what's wrong, and I find myself doing what's wrong. What's going on? And let's read on in verse 20. Now, if I do that that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. You mean this sin nature right here? Uh, is the culprit? That's exactly what he's saying. Well, let's read on. I find then a law or a principle that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And by the way, he's not talking about you being demon-possessed by Satan or something like that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this little guy right there that's going to be with you until Jesus Christ returns. And when we get our new bodies, guess what? This guy is not going to be part of that. We have something really good to look forward to. But in the meantime, we've got an enemy. And that enemy is called the flesh. Let's read on. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Well, that's the top half right here. Uh, delights in the principles that God has, has set forth. Verse 23, But I see another principle in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am. By the way, Paul is saying this after he was saved. This isn't, he's not referring to some time before he was saved. Uh, if, it, listen, if you're here and you're not saved, you don't have this struggle. You're sin. And uh, you'll just go with your feelings. And if it feels good, you feel good. And uh, that's it. Um, oh, wretched man that I am, verse 24. And look at what he asks. Who shall deliver or who shall set me free from the body of this death. And then he gives the answer. And so the Apostle Paul in, uh, uh, asked the question, all right? In verse uh, 22, we just read it. In verse 23, uh, 22 is in reference to the new. 23 is in reference to the old. Uh, and he asked the question in verse 20, uh, 24. And the question is this. Let's just read it. Who shall deliver me? Who shall set me free from this body? And in verse 25, we have the answer. Look at the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And he goes on, and let's just uh, read on in uh, part of Paul's explanation. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, it's interesting that in the original, the last phrase, who walk after the flesh, or walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, is not in verse 1. It is in verse 4. But in verse 1, it just ends with there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, this is the freedom worth 
preaching about. You, you follow? Jesus Christ said, the truth shall set you free. Freedom, by the way, is a good thing. And when we think of freedom, well, what do your kids think of? Freedom? I, I want to be free. I want to be free from obeying my parents. And I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And I'm never going to carry the garbage again. I'm free from that. And uh, uh, you say it's snowing outside? Yeah, you got a 17-year-old strong back teenager who's playing games. And uh, what does he say? Let the old man get his own snowblower and blow snow. Uh, I've got more important things to do for myself. I'm free. Well, let's read on. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, what did the law do? Well, we won't take the time to look, but the law says, don't do this, don't do that, don't covet. And Paul tried to covet, or tried not to covet. He says, the more I tried not to covet, the more I coveted. And now he says, you know what? The law, just by making a list of rules, doesn't give us victory over the sin nature. But God, verse 3, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, and here it is, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In other words, who is dictating policy in your life? Verse 5, For they are after the flesh, for they that are at, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, listen, as a human being, uh, we take pretty good care of ourselves, don't we? It's very important to us how we feel about things. And, uh, uh, and yet, if we follow the Spirit, we'll pay attention to things that are uh, of the Spirit. He reads on and he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the word carnal there is a, a word that is in reference to just natural thinking. Because the natural mind, verse 7, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And so as we stop and we think of being set free, God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, wants to free us from the domination of that sin nature. And you're somebody's uh, uh, fool. Is that everybody somebody's fool, something like that? You have a master. And Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and anyone else. Choose your master. Joshua in the Old Testament told the people, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me, in my house, we're going to choose to serve the Lord. Not everybody agreed with him. Not everybody agreed with him. And as we think about um, Jesus, what he had to say, uh, what makes us free? You know, in John 8, 32, we have this. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is what Jesus is talking about. They didn't get it at the time. Uh, he's talking to his disciples. And in John 8, 36, it says, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And free from what? We ask. Well, in John uh, 8.35, a verse in between those two, it's the control of the sin nature. Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. So, who is your master? Is it Jesus Christ? And you say, well, how do I let Jesus Christ dictate policy? Isn't he sitting up in heaven and... And uh, he hasn't talked to me directly lately, but you know, he has. 
He's called the Word of God. It's the Bible. Is God's Word. Have you ever heard the Bible referred to as God's Word? He talks to us through His Word. And He's given us His Spirit, which helps us understand and apply that Word. And that Spirit convicts us. You know what? You're not in line with God's Word. We can be set free. And while the false teachers promise freedom, and they promise freedom from all kinds of constraints. And I was, I was trying to think of an illustration, and the, all these train derailments uh, kind of uh, came to mind. Uh, a train is made to run on the tracks. You knew that. Now, what if a train said, you know what, these tracks are very confining. I'm kind of jealous of trucks. They can go anywhere. You know, I can turn left, right, and at any road they come, and I can't. I'm, I've got to just stick to the tracks. How confining. Okay, well, go off the rails. How far do you get? Did you know that we are created to bring honor and glory to God? That's our purpose. Those are the rails that God has established for us. And when we go off the rails, how far do you get? You don't get very far. You're just a pile of immovable stuff laying on the side that's not moving. Trains are not free to operate how they're supposed to operate unless they stay on the rails. And did you know that as a child of God, you are not free to operate how God intends us to operate unless we stay on the rails. And if we go off the rails, in fact, that term is used and applied to all kinds of situations, people going off the rails. Um, uh, remember this, that the flesh wants to take us off the rails and it sells us on the idea that God and his restrictions are enslaving you and you're not free. Well, why, what, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? And Peter is given a very strong warning to this church, which is full of young believers, to watch out for all these false promises uh, of freedom that don't bring freedom at all. They just bring slavery. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that you understood perfectly what sin would do to the human race. And you had a perfect plan to not only save us from the penalty of sin, but to rescue us, to deliver us from the very power of sin in our lives and to set us free for the purpose that you designed for us. We pray that as your children, we would understand that the purpose you've designed for us is by far the best purpose we could possibly have and so we pray that we'd be willing to follow your word, to allow the Spirit of God to keep us on the rails as we move towards our end here on this earth. We thank you. We thank you for this reminder. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's uh, stand together and we'll sing the last verse of There is a Redeemer.